What we're going to try and do with this, uh, this panel is uh, address uh, some uh, current uh, topics uh, that uh, um, uh, may be of interest. Uh, we will address some of the things perhaps that John had in his, some of his observations. And so uh, we hope that this will be of interest uh, to you. Uh, when this panel was uh, first uh, uh, contemplated, uh, there were some questions around the general topic of service demands, and so the overall topic was, uh, was what service is the district providing, uh, what demands are the water users imposing on the district or asking the district to be able to supply, and how is the district managing those, and what do those look like today, and what will those look like in 5, 10, 20, 50 years from now. And uh, a couple of the other questions were in terms of what was driving those trends, and what challenges uh, and uh, expectations uh, were the districts having meeting those trends? Uh, what the, were the technical, financial, administrative, and, and environmental aspects uh, of those? Uh, everything we do has multifacets to it, uh, as, we can, as we can see, and so we need to address all of those details. Uh, we discussed a whole host of topics. Uh, in the time available, we've uh, chosen to focus on three. And um, those are... There we go. So we've chosen to focus on three. We're going to uh, focus on water operations and response. Uh, we're going to then uh, direct our attention to water quality issues. Uh, and finally, we'll end up uh, discussing infrastructure improvements and asset management. Uh, four districts were chosen to represent uh, that uh, spectrum uh, of uh, district diversity. And that should give us a bit of a multi uh, uh, focal approach uh, to these topics. And so you can, we have our four district managers up here and uh, most people are familiar with this chart. Uh, I've uh, helped uh, with this busyness in this chart and circled the four districts involved. Uh, and in no particular order, uh, the first district uh, was Chris Gallagher's district, the Tabor Irrigation District. And I'll introduce uh, Chris uh, and all four of the managers uh, with their districts, and then I'll allow the managers uh, to speak a little bit about their districts and how their district uh, uh, provides some perhaps unique uh, aspects in terms of it's either its operations, its crop mix, its water users that uh, allow us to add some diversity to the panel. So hopefully they're ready for that uh, question. Um, Chris, our Tabor Irrigation District, they're kind of wedged in the middle of uh, the sprawling SMRID, as you can see on the chart, and, and uh, they have, uh, they're uniquely positioned, I think, to, uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, Chris is a biological engineer uh, with a degree from the University of Guelph. Uh, he was transplanted with his, with his wife to Lethbridge, where his water specialization was earned through a diploma uh, in watershed management at the Lethbridge College. After gaining nearly six years of uh, in irrigation design experience uh, and his professional engineer's license at UMA, he joined the SMRID's engineering team uh, and was there for six years. He then moved into the manager's role at the TID in 2013. I'm going to skip through a whole bunch of this stuff, Chris, uh, and to just simply cap it off by saying he enjoys running and playing saxophone with his wife, uh, and uh, mountain biking uh, with his son Owen, I can relate to that, uh, supporting his wife Katie with ringette uh, and music. Uh, he also plays rec hockey and holds out hope for a Leafs Cup in his lifetime. <laughs> Good luck at that, Chris. Uh, Cam Anderson is uh, on the, with us here. He's from the uh, McGrath Irrigation District, uh, and they are circled on the map there too. They are tucked away uh, almost in the foothills, uh, but not quite. Uh, we could, I guess, classify them as the smallest district on the panel, so they have some unique perspectives. Uh, Cam grew up uh, south of McGrath on a farm where he still resides today. He worked for the McGrath Irrigation District since 2010. Uh, enjoying involvement with all the people involved in that district. In addition to working with uh, the McGrath district, Cam is kept busy with his three children, operating his small irrigated hay farm, and enjoys horses, golfing, and anything to do with agriculture. The next district uh, is the Eastern Irrigation District, and Ivan is with us uh, today. And Eastern Irrigation District is uh, circled on the map, and uh, 
um, in terms of land base uh, uh, is the largest and has uh, some unique challenges as well that we'll hear about. Uh, Ivan has worked with the Eastern Irrigation District for 25 years. Uh, he began his career in their engineering department as a technician, gaining experience uh, in all aspects of project design and receiving his professional licensed engineering certification, after which his department, he uh, uh, was promoted to department engineering manager and in March 2019, he was named as the general manager of the district and continues to pursue initiatives that secure EID's technological advancements, water use efficiencies within the district and the irrigation industry. And uh, the last uh, the district uh, to introduce is, uh, is uh, the Lethbridge Northern Irrigation District uh, with Alan Harold. And Alan sent me about five pages of bio. I'm only going to do about a half page. Uh, Alan is uh, currently the general manager of the LNID. He commenced his career there in 1973. Uh, that's a long time, Alan. That's before I was born, almost. Uh, he uh, started in the office of the Auditor General and uh, was involved in auditing some of the irrigation districts. He came to his senses and in 1978 accepted a management position at the LNID as the Secretary uh, Treasurer. Uh, he then uh, worked for the LNID uh, with uh, the Board of Directors until 2007 when he became the General Manager, responsible for all aspects of the district, uh, and uh, continues to uh, serve in that position to this day. He uh, currently serves as a member of uh, uh, Water Quality and Invasive Species Steering Committees with Alberta Agriculture and Rural Development. Uh, he also uh, is involved in the Alberta waterways with the invasion of zebra and quagga mussels and other invasive species, and he serves as an irrigation rep and treasurer on the Old Man Watershed Council. So there's our districts. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to ask each of our districts in turn to, uh, um, in the same order, Tabor, McGrath, Eastern, and LNID, to introduce their district and tell us a little bit about them, and uh, uh, so you can get a kind of flavor of uh, of what they're uh, what they're about. So we'll start with uh, Tabor. Okay, thanks very much, Tom. Really appreciate the introduction. And yes, I was born after 1967, so <laughs> the last time the Leafs won the cup. Um, so yeah, Tabor Irrigation District. So we're a mid-sized and relatively compact district. Um, you can tell pretty obviously from the map there. We have about uh, 85,000 acres or so on our assessment roll. About 6,800 acres are not irrigated. Um, and then about 1,500 acres that are still left unsold within our expansion limit. So we got a little bit of room left, but not a whole lot. Not like BRID. So our, our last our expansion limit was last amended in, in 2011, so we sold a bunch of acres uh, just in the last uh, few years. Uh, we have about 400 entities owning irrigation acres, representing about uh, 120 actual owners, about 500 rural and household water users, and about 30 municipal and industrial or other water users, and some that are notable. Uh, Town of Tabor, Village of Barnwell, Lamb Weston, and Lantic, and you'd recognize that as Rogers Sugar. So we have a long history known, uh, being known as specialty crop country. And Richard, we most recently regained top spot from BRID par by percentage at 36.9. Uh, <clears throat> notable crops, of course, include potatoes, sugar beets, dry beans, fresh peas, canola seed, fresh corn, and onions. Um, cereals are the next on the list, uh, followed by forages. So we are unique in that we order all of our water from another irrigation district. So we receive our water through the SMRID main canal and we participate in the main canal advisory committee as Gordon talked about uh, when you talked about IRICAN this morning. And of course, yes, we are a partner uh, on IRICAN as well as an independent corporation. Um, <clears throat> so the board at TID um, has held a high standard for the level of service to our water users and supported many uh, continuous improvement initiatives uh, that include uh, water security and availability, water quality stewardship, operational efficiency, and prevention and preparation for an, in, uh, an invasive species introduction. Um, so that's, that's us in a, a nutshell, and, and uh, in terms of the, the discussion today, um, I'm to blame for the topic but not the content. Yeah. 
Can you guys hear me? I think it's on. Oh, there we go. Okay, so a little bit about McGrath Irrigation District. We are considered one of the mountain districts. We're one of the smaller districts at 18,300 acres. Um, our district was formed in June of 1924. Uh, we have 126 rate payers in our district. We serve 56 households. Uh, we provide to the town of McGrath as well as um, yard water. for the, So there's a whole irrigation system going through the town of McGrath. Um, we have a lot of pressure, very high pressure pipelines, which is great to get rid of pumpers, but a lot of it is a little bit too high <laughs> as the hills to the west. Um, our district consists of a lot of forage, uh, a lot of alfalfa growing out there. Uh, we have three employees and three board members, and they're currently in kind of in a rehabilitation expansion study stage in our district right now, looking to um, where we're going to be in 10 to 15 years as far as uh, pipelines and increased canals. And so that's been a real interesting uh, study going through that, trying to figure out where we're going. Um, and that's basically all I've got. Okay, the Eastern Irrigation District. Uh, we've been around uh, for about 85 years, uh, since 1935 when the CPR turned it over and EID was born. Uh, we encompass about 1.5 million acres, and I, I think there's a map up there, uh, basically bounded by the Red Deer River to the north and the Bow River to the south. Uh, we're governed by a board of seven directors. Uh, we employ about 75 staff, and it serves about 1,000 irrigators. And that's one maybe trend that we see, um, you know, say in the last 15, 20 years, we were probably around 1,200 irrigators today, uh, we're 1,000. So I think it speaks uh, farms, farms are getting larger. Uh, water is conveyed to 305,000 acres within that 1.5 million acres. Uh, growing forage, we're about 43% forage, cereals 31, oil seeds uh, 8%, specialty crops uh, 17%. Uh, our, our irrigation expansion limit uh, presently is 311,000, so we're, we're getting close uh, to that number, and uh, our board is just in the, I guess, initial discussions. We've done some of our modeling with Alberta uh, Agriculture and Environment, uh, but we are uh, just kind of in the infancy of having those discussions and, and doing an expansion plan in the order of 25 to 30,000 acres. Um, one other thing that makes us unique, uh, I think, to other district is all of our conveyance infrastructure, including the Bassano Dam, the Earthen Dam, and the new emergency spillway that is in place, uh, is owned and operated by the district. Um, that has some pros and that has some cons uh, that, that go with it. Uh, so our conveyance network includes about 2,000 kilometers of canals and pipelines. Um, of which uh, about uh, 1,300 now is in pipeline. Another thing that might make us a bit unique, not completely, I think other districts do have a drainage network, but we have a vast drainage network of uh, 2,000 kilometers of, of drainage infrastructure. And again, that has its pros and it has its cons. Uh, pros is, you know, we can take the drainage, cons is of course it comes at a cost. Uh, we've been aggressively, as I mentioned, aggressively rehabilitating that conveyance works and uh, again, a big percentage of our conveyance works is now in pipeline. Another unique part of our district is we do have a large land base. Uh, the EID does own 580,000 acres of pasture land. Uh, it's largely used for community grazings, which we give to uh, 10 community grazing associations. And that does provide us uh, with um, a big percentage, or, or basically all our revenues uh, for our district. And again, that uh, those revenues uh, come with some pros and it comes with some cons. Uh, there's definitely, uh, for our district, um, there's expectations that go with a bank account. And uh, so a lot of times we're managing expectations. And I need to dispel some of uh, Gordon Zobel's myth. He maybe should do some fact, fact checker. 
Um, yeah, fake news. You know, some of the districts have a pretty good sized bank account when you divide that into the irrigated acres. Uh, so um, maybe we sh the next time you can, uh, you may have to change the fleet uh, that uh, you show that we have. <laughs> Some of the partnerships we have uh, with the county have been very, very good in our area. Uh, one of those being the joint drainage program. So we've partnered with the county. We each put in a set amount of number each year and uh, we do the drainage work. So to date, it's, uh, it's about we've done it for 10 years and uh, we've rehabbed uh, about 230 kilometers of district and municipal drains. So that's been a great uh, a great partnership with them, and of course to the benefit of our water users. The other was uh, an incentive grant. Um, the County of Newell uh, has now a potable water throughout the district. Uh, so all our farmyards, acreages, everybody had the chance at potable water right to their doorstep. Uh, the district helped in providing, uh, to, to help in some of the costs to do those hookups to our water users, and again, that's been a great uh, asset to our area. Uh, one of the strange things we do is we're an ISP provider. We're an internet provider. We've been doing that for 25 years. And again, the board of the day thought uh, this was a, a service that was required for our area. Uh, so uh, they, they pushed it forward. They spearheaded it. And again, we're on the cusp of, uh, as, as demands increase uh, through the internet, um, you know, as... Uh, John mentioned here, you can run all your pivots straight from your phone, those demands, all that uh, data that runs through. And we're becoming very tied to that internet system as well. Um, but we see that uh, it needs to expand. So again, uh, we're having those discussions as, as what we need to do. But again, uh, a great service. Uh, and basically, no, no man left un, you know, standing. Everybody in our area has the same opportunity, uh, even if you're at the out, very outskirts of our district. Uh, we own and operate um, some campgrounds on two of our reservoirs. Um, because we have such a big, large land base, uh, there was a lot of random camping. Uh, so uh, we uh, built these campgrounds to, uh, you know, there's a demand for recreation and uh, irrigation does provide a recreational opportunities. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, uh, this facility was built. When we rehabilitate, um, you know, back, uh, you know, our ditches were seepy, uh, lots of willows, lots of growth. Uh, when we pipeline, of course, we remove that habitat. And so uh, to mitigate some of that habitat loss, I mean, we have a, a great pheasant, pheasant uh, industry and upland game industry. And to, so to mitigate some of that ha habitat loss, we do have a habitat program where uh, over the last, uh, since 98, we've planted over 550,000 trees and shrubs uh, in, in the area. As well, without irrigation and our diversion uh, at Pisano, um, the wetlands in our area, they would not exist. Uh, and so we provide water to uh, uh, all those wetlands and DU projects uh, in the order of 30,000 acres uh, um, uh, you know, in, in, in our district. Um, so I guess that's a brief uh, description of our district and, and maybe what sets it or is unique from others. Still on? Well, despite what Tom says, I don't have a lot of words, usually, but uh, I'll give you a basic overview of our district. Uh, we've been in existence since 1921. We're governed by five elected board members and we currently have 34 staff. We're in a geographic area which begins west of Fort McLeod, south of Carmen Gay. It's west of the Little Bow River and north of the Old Man River. Uh, we currently serve about 191,000 acres of uh, acres of irrigation on 1,750 parcels of land. There's over 600 domestic and other use purpose users and we convey 11,000 acre feet to private license holders. The, the, we're the only district that basically has water delivery right out of the Old Man Dam through the old, down the Old Man River and diverted near Brockett. Uh, currently we have letters of commitment out for water rights. Other than that, we are in a moratorium state. 
uh, and the board are going to be reviewing that. Uh, the other things are that 56% uh, of our crops are forage directed, largely to help support a very intensive livestock industry in the LNID. Uh, just to give you some round numbers, if you took all the feedlot cattle in the province of Alberta and Saskatchewan combined, the LNID has three quarters of those numbers in our district. Uh, it's not known around Picture Butte as Feedlot Alley for a reason. I've talked to some other districts and one said, well, I've got three feedlots. I said, I've got three feedlots driving down a mile of road. So we have a lot of manure to deal with in our district and therefore we're quite concerned about drainage and what have you in the canals. Uh, we have 200 kilometers of canals and ditches and roughly about 600 uh, kilometers of pipeline. We're blessed with high line ditches which can flow into pipelines. Uh, about 72% of our, of our channels now have been converted to pipelines and out of those pipelines, 95% contain high pressure deliveries which is 45 PSI plus. Uh, it's a good revenue generator but the result, I think it's good for the local area and the environment if we've eliminated over 225 pumping systems on irrigation farms, which I think stands well. The, uh, but we do have a revenue generator as an equalizer so that uh, where the individuals are charged a pressure charge, which helps keep what the other landowners that are still paying for energy costs helps level the playing field and they contribute into the water rates of the district. Uh, the other thing is the LNID is somewhat unique in, from other districts from what I understand is I believe we're the only district that charges a construction contribution on capital projects. That ranges in the area, it averages in the area of about 9%, 10% that the landowners pay. We've been doing that since 1995 which has certainly contributed money back into the Irrigation Works Reserve. I must admit that in 1995 when we first started, naturally the response was, well, how come we have to pay? The guys before us didn't. Whereas now, I think the landowners are very understanding, not that they want to depart with more funds, but they realize the benefit of the pipelines that we're going to be putting in, and now they come to the meetings with the question, okay, well, what is our assessment going to be and generally we allow them a three-year payout for that capital construction charge. It varies by the amount of pressure on a project and uh, it has changed over the years and we have a minimum charge as well on those particular projects. And by the way, that also is applied to any future parcel that gets added, which means if there's a subdivision in the district and they need a delivery from the pipeline, even if it was the mother parcel and a landowner wants to retire and he says, well, now I'm going to create this subdivision. Now that subdivision pays as a unique parcel even though the irrigation parcel had paid. It's a separate delivery now and everybody going forward has to pay into it. I had one landowner question that at one time and I said, well, let's take a look at this as an element of fairness. If you were on the line when we first put it in and the landowners on the line had to pay, all domestic users and everything, and you had to pay, what would you think if your neighbor down the way created a parcel two years later and he didn't have to pay? And he says, well, okay, he says, now I understand. As long as every parcel is paying towards that project, then I understand that that's the case. If they're getting a delivery, they're gonna pay. And what we do is, even though the pipeline might have been put in 15, 20 years ago, uh, doesn't avoid the wrath of the assessment. And it's assessed not what they were 20 years ago, but what is the going rate at the current type of project that this was off of based on pressure, et cetera. So that's some of the uniqueness of, of the LNID. I think that those construction contributions of put back into our irrigation works reserve, which has helped us fund projects, even though we've had quite a decline in IRP funding. Uh, we're currently IRP funds in the hole. 
of about $7 million, and we're still continuing to do projects that we're funding out of our own irrigation works reserve, which has been largely accumulated not only from charging landowners for their contribution into a project, but also with some of the sales of the water rights, but those water rights are starting to be less of them are available. And right now, I know what, what uh, John Colk would like to see, uh, but the thing is, is when we're doing expansion, obviously we're looking at, at uh, less infrastructure, if at all possible, and on the, main, on the government main canal, I mean, eventually we will take over the turnout after a year or so as far as the, the structure itself. We're not about to take over some type of uh, siphon screen or anything like that as far as pumping. Uh, but I think that the, uh, we're set up fairly well moving forward for future irrigation to address one of John's concerns as well. The LNID has for a number of years now been installing 10-foot spools on the delivery, irrigation delivery, before the landowner connects to it. That 10-foot spool is totally intended for the installation of most likely micrometer meters in the future to be charging by water usage. We also have those water meters on the three pump stations that we have, but those are not for the intention of assessing based on the amount of water they use, but they're, they're intended to, on those pump stations, because the energy car, uh, charge is allocated to each of the landowners, we monitor the amount of consumption they have, and obviously if you irrigate more, you use more water, then your share of the power bill is gonna be higher. And that's the purpose of that. They're still charged the regular charge per, per uh, irrigation acre, the same as anybody else. And on those three pump stations, they pay a, a pump replacement fund and maintenance, whereby for a certain number of years, they're charged an additional amount per acre. Usually, to begin with, it starts out at $7 per acre and slowly goes down as we build a reserve for each of those particular uh, pump stations, whereby if we ever have to replace pumps, then the users have paid towards the, the usage of those pumps and the eventual replacement, where it's not a new lander gets stuck with an unforeseen bill because he just happened to buy the land at that particular time. So those are a couple of the unique things with the LNID as opposed to compared to the other districts that I understand. Okay, thanks everybody. So we'll move now to uh, the uh, topics and hopefully we can put these topics into context of the differences between these, uh, these four districts. And so the, uh, the first topic we wanna try and address are issues related to water operations and response. And we've been supplied with a, with a few slides up there and I think some of our fellows will uh, speak to maybe some of those issues that are there. Uh, and I'd like to start uh, this particular topic by handing it to Chris uh, of the Tabor Irrigation District. Would you like to start this one out and address some of the things that uh, have come up on this? Sure. And I won't go over the full list of stuff I have, so I have an opportunity for, for my colleagues here to, to chime in. Um, probably the first topic related to water operations and response um, that I'd like to address is, is uh, startup. And, uh, you know, we heard some presentations uh, this conference talking about the growing season and heat units and all that type of thing. Um, additionally, it's been brought to our attention that there are early season sensitivities for a number of our, our crops, and some are well known, uh, such as sugar beets, um, but seed canola as well. Um, and so that's what would be a level of service expectation on, the, on behalf of the water users. They want us to do everything we can that's reasonably possible to try and get the water up and running um, and to their point of delivery as soon as possible. So um, we, we work with a partner and so part of that is communicating those, uh, those concerns and, and expectations to, uh, to SMRID and they have their own limitations of, of what they can do. So, um, so that's one part of it. And then the other part of it has to do with what we can do internally. And we've had some really interesting conversations recently. Um, I've been speaking with our operations staff and talking with our board of directors. And 
And, uh, you know, John, you made a really good comment there about uh, the attitude of service and the expectations there, that when you go into to the district office, to be able to hear, uh, instead of, we don't do that, or we can't do that, or, uh, but how can we make that happen? And that's kind of the attitude that we've, uh, we've tried to address with this particular issue, issue. And so we're going back to our operations staff and saying, okay, guys, let's take a look. Where are the points in that uh, startup process that we can maybe cut down the timelines? Can we gain some efficiencies? And that's really, when we talk about level of service expectations, that's the way that me as a manager and us as staff are having to, to look a little differently at it and say, yeah, like, we're, we're seeing your point of view. You, you've got a good rationale there. And it, the onus is now on us to try and, and uh, um, be able to do something about it. But the other part of it is to um, address the reasonable expectations part of it as well, and understanding things like time of travel, um, and issues such as stuff getting blown into our ditches and all that kind of thing. And uh, I think Alan alluded to fairness um, at one point in his talk there. You know, what do you do about the person who uh, is at the, the front of the system and can start earlier, say they're pumping out of a reservoir or in our case, you know, maybe off the SMRID main canal and the guy at the end of the, the system. And there's some physical limitations about why that person down, further down the line can't get water at the same time as the guy at the start. But are we making changes that will get that first person water, uh, first uh, water that first person and sacrificing and even extending the amount of time it takes to get water to the guy at the end? So these are the, the issues that we're struggling with and trying to address in a fair way um, Anyway, that's, that's the, the first topic, is this earlier water. Great, thanks, Chris. I'm going to now uh, ask uh, Cam to uh, address uh, what uh, the challenges are in this area in his district. Well, I would say we don't really have a lot of challenges in this area. Um, I think we've got a really smooth system of delivering water. Um, the only thing I've noticed over the year, past five years, I would say, is... Um, there's a lot more, I don't know what you call them, irrigation advisors going around telling people when to irrigate, which I think is very good. It's been, we've got a lot of users using them and it's really efficient. But we are seeing with that a lot more on and offs than we usually see. I mean, it, it's a little more, more tough on the ditch rider, but um, that's the only negative thing I would say is, is just as far as ditch rider stress. But uh, I mean, it's way more efficient use of water. Um, we're seeing a, a little uniqueness out there. I don't know if anyone else has seen it, but a lot of guys are trying to go for four cuts of alfalfa now. And that's kind of interesting because some, I don't know if it's worth it or not, but that's requiring a lot more, a lot more water usage, you know? So the guys are getting closer to their allotment more, which is, which is interesting. But um, overall, I think, you know, we're lucky. We're a small district. We can deliver water fairly quick and we've got a really good rapport with our irrigators. Uh, everyone has a lot of respect and uh, I think we're, we're pretty good in this area. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, who we go to next? Uh, Eastern, Ivan. Yeah, so I, I think uh, my colleagues here have, have touched on, on, on most of it. Uh, from EID's experience, yeah, our trends are similar. Uh, earlier startup, our typical startup might be, um, say May 8th to 10th, we're definitely seeing that going earlier, you know, 1st of May, even pushing into, <clears throat> excuse me, the end of April. Um, and in particular, we have some geographical differences. So our southern parts of our district at times are two to three weeks sooner. They're, they're on the fields two to, week, two to three weeks sooner than some parts uh, uh, in, in, in the northern part of our district. So. You know, there's been some conversation, well, can we start the system up, uh, you know, in, in the southern part of our district first? And um, operationally, yes, we can do that. Uh, but of course, when the neighbor looks over the fence and he doesn't happen to be in the southern part of that district and he can't start up, you know, it, it does create um, uh, some issues uh, uh, around that. So, I mean, I guess communication and, and, un and trying to... Uh, communicate why we're doing that and that they understand it uh, uh, can be a challenge. 
Um, as far as delivery of water, um, you know, our policy is 48 hours notice when you order water. Um, and that would be the extreme case. Uh, I think there's only one part of our district that if we don't have the water available, it would take 48 hours to get there. So generally we like 24 hours of notice. Um, and that's just part of good water management. We need to know where it's going when it's required. Um, so our water operators can get the water there and you know, they have a pretty good idea as who's turning on, turning off, et cetera. So, you know, 24 hours, we would sure like 24 hours, but you know, in, in some cases, uh, um, I think the, between the water user and the, and the ditch rider, they have agreement, so to speak, and, and they know, you know, when the neighbor's turning off it, or what have you. So, uh, you know, at times it's almost immediate, you know, we can deliver uh, immediately depending on, on the situation. Uh, generally, our peak demands are way down. Um, our canals don't really uh, run at full capacity most of the time, and uh, I think we're seeing, as far as trends go, you know, it's just more efficient. Uh, we were used to be, not long ago, in 2003, 45% pivot irrigation. And largely, the rest was flood. Today, you know, we're well over 80% and about 15% flood, so uh, much more efficient than we used to be. Um, high water uh, crop demands, uh, we see less of that, you know, a little bit less alfalfa and irrigated pasture grown in our area and moving more over to the specialty crops. Um, however, I, we realize that you can't um, rely on that trend if markets change, uh, so will those trends. Uh, and larger farms, as I had mentioned, you know, we're, we had 1,200 irrigators, now we're down to around 1,000. So, so larger farms uh, are, are, you know, so part of why we don't have that peak because they are rotating their stream of water within, within their own unit, which, um, you know, does provide some benefits to us um, as far as efficiencies go. Uh, and, uh, you know, less on and off, so to speak, because they just rotate that within their, their farming unit. Okay, Alan, do you want to wrap that one up? Uh, one thing with our district is... I guess this is a bit of a uniqueness as well, is we have to work very closely with Alberta Environment Headworks Group. As of the water coming out of the Old Man Dam, there's a time of travel. And today with automation the way it is, sometimes it's hard to get landowners when we tell them you need to give us 24 hours notice to order the water. Well, it's hard for them when they're being told or advised um, if they've sublet out their crops or what have you that under contract that it needs water, that they just can't go to their phone, hit the button, and the system comes on. And because we have so many pipelines, there's always water in the pipeline, right? You go, it's like going to your kitchen sink, you turn on the tap, you get water. The problem that is, it's hard to get them to understand is, however that is served by a, a canal, that that water is already in there in order because it was delivered for somebody else further downstream. To give you an idea of the time of travel, when you, we order water from the Old Man Dam, it takes 19 hours to get from the Old Man Dam, diverted out of the river, to the Monarch Headgates. It takes another four hours from the Monarch Headgates to actually get to Keogh Lake. Then from Keogh Lake, anything taken out of there is anywhere from eight to 10 hours to the eastern portion of our district. So it's important that for people to understand that as, as convenient as it is and as much as our ditch riders try to uh, accommodate offs and ons as quickly as possible, there is a reason for the, for the uh, time required for ordering the water, bringing it down. Yes, we have Keogh Reservoir. Can we supplement that and draw it down? Absolutely. So somebody in the east, just because they've ordered water, that doesn't necessarily mean that, that it's going to take 24 hours to get it there because we we've got the balancing bond at Keogh to draw it down. But the fact of the matter is, is it still takes 8 to 10 hours, depending on the portion of the district that you're in. So it's, it's a matter of... of Having the landowners understand, as important as it is for them to get the water on their land, that there is a time of travel for water. And as I think between Alberta Environment staff and the LNID staff, they work very hard and diligently to get that water as quickly as possible. They try to project 
based on weather forecasts, et cetera, but at the same time, we're looking at efficiencies. So they're, they're darn if they do and darn if they don't because we're on their case if they're spilling too much water, uh, if they put too much water in the system and then there's no call for it. So we take a look at that. Another issue that is coming up is uh, more so, which is demanding longer growing season for a lot of these fields now, is double cropping. And people have started to go to that. And so that's put a bigger demand on crop rotations, et cetera, where our system used to be able to accommodate individuals coming off or on sooner. Now individuals are irrigating longer. They no sooner harvest one crop and they got another crop in the ground ready to be irrigated and that. So uh, that's one of the main things that we have with water orders. Two years ago in 2018, uh, staff, field staff were telling me uh, we're running into another issue here. And well, I, I, I don't know that we're gonna have a real quick answer on this one. Because we started out with an allocation of 12 inches, which has been a while since we had a lower than our usual 17 and a half inch allocation, uh, the feedback coming to me was these landowners are saying, look, I don't want to be charged in your didit system for 24 hours usage anymore. Uh, I'd like my water turned on at 8 o'clock in the morning and I want it turned off tonight at 10 o'clock. Well, that's a pretty hard thing to monitor and, con and control. So I only want to be charged for 14 hours and you know how much my pivot is using. Uh, no, that right now we don't have the answer for that because I don't have the ability to control that. I don't have staff out there patrolling the ditches and uh, adjusting the records at 10 o'clock at night. We don't do that on a 24 hour basis. So I think that's a, an issue that we have to look at trying to resolve moving forward but immediately we don't have the answer to that. We're just gonna have to continue with the 24 hour turnaround as far as that, is, that goes. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, we will, uh, there'll be an opportunity, I hope, I'm watching the time here and we've got more issues than time, but uh, we'll hold our questions to the end and maybe with Margot's indulgence, we'll have a little bit of extra time at the end for some questions. So uh, I'd like to move on to the next uh, larger topic is uh, water quality uh, and uh, threw up a slide kind of encapsulating some of the issues there. Uh, and I'd like to start with uh, move this direction on the table. So Chris, you're on. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'll try and Make it quick here. So yeah, in terms of water quality, we just break it down into two different forms. One is physical water quality, the other is chemical or biological water quality. So the physical, I mean, that's basically just debris. And where this is coming from is uh, the increased precision agriculture, VRI, uh, finer nozzles on the uh, sprinklers and that type of thing. And what John was talking about with his uh, uh, and it's, it's very common now to have larger operations with one guy looking after irrigation, and they can't be there to babysit everything all the time. So there's a reasonable expectation for the supply water to be managed in such a way that there's not an excessive amount of physical debris. The expectations are starting to creep, and we're seeing, well, we want it a little cleaner so that we're not uh, having to clean out our Clemens pressure fil filter every two hours. Well, then we have to have another stage of cleanliness that, to deal with, um, and then some that, uh, you know, will expect a gabion wall infiltration system or some sort of something like that so that they don't need any filtering. So that's something that we sometimes have to address is, okay, what's a reasonable standard for water quality across the district, and how do we address it? And really what we're doing on is, is using a complaints basis uh, approach and uh, prioritization. Where are the worst problems? Uh, and, and getting an idea from our operations staff. On the chemical biological, uh, the, it's coming from third party verification. Things like Canada Gap, Potato Sustainability Initiative, and just understanding our social license to operate. And we're trying to, uh, uh, involvement with the IDWQ, uh, Irrigation District Water Quality and then uh, doing some of our own investigations and looking where are the sources of, uh, of 
contamination uh, in our zone. So we've been doing the uh, reservoir riparian enhancement project, um, some constructed wetlands and, and things like that to try and clean the water up so it's, it's chemically and biologically cleaner. Thanks, Chris. That was uh, that was concise. Uh, Ivan. Yeah, I, I don't think I have too much to add. Uh, too much from what Chris uh, said. Yeah, water quality. Obviously, it's it's weeds and and you know what what's in the water, um, uh, physically and and the chemistry of it uh, or, or silt. Um, historically, I guess our district uh, was mostly flood. Nobody cared at that time unless it plugged off uh, your cuts in your in your uh, your ditch. Uh, nobody cared. Now that we're upwards of 80% pivot, of course, uh, pivots are coming in, finer nozzles, etc. Uh, so the EID uses a suite of uh, mechanical cleaners, traveling screen side sweeps, um, and now uh, that comes obviously with capital costs and ongoing um, maintenance costs. Uh, so we've moved, um, and I think it might have been Tabor who uh, showed us uh, the technology is Gabion Walls. Uh, those have been uh, quite successful for us so far, uh, and we've moved a lot of our systems now. We're actually removing some of our screen cleaners and putting, putting in Gabion Walls. And, you know, we think in the long run, um, you know, why they, while they might cost the same or maybe even more as far as installation uh, over the long haul with the... Uh, the ongoing costs, uh, it, it will be better. Uh, chemically, we use Magnesite H, um, and again, we used to have a more of a reactive approach uh, to our system, so if there's globs of weeds, it was time to treat. Um, now we take a more proactive approach, and again, I think that's through the, call it the pressures of the water users and the demands of the water users. You know, they can't be there every two hours cleaning their filters, um, you know, and that's not very efficient for the district either. So uh, we've uh, used more of a re, um, proactive approach. Now we do more of a timed um, chemical treatment every two weeks or maybe every three weeks uh, 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 throughout the season. Uh, runoff, um, as far as water quality issues, isn't quite as big a concern as I understand that the other districts might have. As I mentioned, we have a vast drainage network, uh, so a lot of the drainage that we have does not enter our delivery system. It is in our drainage system, so we typically don't have, there are some areas of course, but we typically don't have the water quality issues uh, with uh, accepting drainage. Uh, they are separate systems. Um, of course, all of these systems come at a cost, um, but realistically, water users appreciate it um, and they understand the costs. Um, you know, in our district, say it's $2 an acre uh, costs for our district. If you told a water user, you know, it's going to cost you about 250 bucks uh, so that you don't have to clean your Clemens filter every two hours they'll spend 250 bucks on that pivot. So, you know, as long, long as the education and the communication is there, um, you know, those costs um, can easily pa be passed on and, and very much understood uh, by our water users. Okay, thanks, Ivan. Um, let's, uh, Cam. I'll be, quick, I'll be quick about this here. We, <clears throat> we're lucky, um, being so close to the mountains, I guess, our water's cooler doesn't have time to warm up as much. We don't use magnicide. Uh, we have very little little trouble with uh, weeds and algae. Um, we've just got automated screen cleaners on all of our pipelines and, and it seems to do well. So um, it's not really an issue in our district. Okay, awesome. Excellent. Uh, Alan, you want to uh, wrap this one up? Sure, we're sort of a hybrid, uh, still being fairly close to the mountains. We don't use magnicide in the west portion of our district. It's only when the heat units hit more uh, to the mid to the east portion of our district that we end up using magnicide, but certainly not to the degree and amount that the other districts use. But we do find that we, ha we need it for uh, controlling algae on our clean, uh, screen cleaners and also at the beginning of each of the pipelines and also to control weed growth within the canals. Uh, the district, again, because of our industry of feedlot, cattle in that. I'm not trying to blame them, but it, the, the residual of the cattle obviously is the manure and that is spread over a lot of the land in the district. So the district is very restrictive 
uh, to not allowing individuals to pump off their land into the canal. We certainly won't allow it into pipelines. Uh, there is some drainage that goes into the drains uh, that eventually makes its way to the river, but we try to refrain it as much as possible for any of that water concerned about the quality getting into our delivery system of canals and ditches. Uh, the district does participate with the other irrigation districts in water quality monitoring as far as testing the water, et cetera, and I, th I think there's been, it's been proven that uh, all the irrigation districts have a very good uh, clean source of water, good mountain water that we're delivering for production. There's been no side effects that I understand for any of the crops at all. Thanks, Alan. Uh, we will uh, move to our last topic uh, in the interest of time, and this will be infrastructure improvements. Uh, we are well, certainly there's a graph uh, on the overhead of the trend in uh, IRP funding, uh, and there's no reason to believe that won't continue in that direction. And so there are some challenges uh, dealing with uh, um, the just the cost of maintaining all this infrastructure and continuing to improve it. So we will uh, begin to address that topic, and I'm going to start at the far end with Alan. Well, I've, I've pretty well already mentioned a lot of the stuff with regards to infrastructure in my previous preamble. Uh, but we are going more to uh, gate automation and controlling and balancing it with checks on structures, et cetera, to gain a better control of the water and that to reduce the spill and become more efficiency. So we've been using a lot more automation in our... In our uh, uh, infrastructure, certainly pipelines, uh, that has been a large or a big investment by the district into pressure pipelines, high pressure pipelines, which I did mention reduce the, the pumps out on the landscape. Uh, we've, because of our construction contribution program, it's allowed us to continue uh, with the decline of the IRP funding, which we're hoping will bounce back. Uh, but it has allowed us to endure with that and, and selling some water rights to have the, the investment in uh, money set aside in the reserve to help fund these projects. As I said before, our IRP is $7 million in the hole. Well, that money came out of our own reserve. And uh, we're still aggressively pursuing projects, uh, probably the biggest one coming up is, is to the tune of $16 million. And uh, just to give you an idea, as far as the construction contribution, it's going to, I haven't got the bylaw passed yet, but right now it's targeted at about $330 an acre. And you'll be able to pay that off over a three-year period. So that goes into our own irrigation works reserve, and certainly with the landowners paying 9 to 10 percent of the cost, at least that is helping sustain that fund along with the sale of water rates. Thanks, Alan. I'm going to go to the other end of the table. Cam. Oh, sure. Yeah. We're just um, basically kind of maintaining right now, keeping things running. Um, of course, we have dreams, um, which, which what we're working on now is, is, of course, we're doing a 10 to 15 year study I mentioned before, and we're trying to break down, for us being a smaller district, funding is, a, is obviously a little harder uh, to do big jobs. So we're trying to do um, smaller jobs that we can do in-house, maybe hire a little bit extra help, but um, and just do little segments every year. That's kind of where we're at right now, T working towards like a, a, the big pro the big project of, of uh, you know bigger pipelines in the end. But just doing small phases is kind of what we're doing, especially with the way funding is now. Um, one other thing we're noticing, of course, is uh, like all the concrete or concrete and culverts that were put in back in the 40s and 50s is really starting to show wear. So we're having to do a lot more O&M and that's kind of costly for us. So that's, that's a little challenge for us right now is just, is just funding for O&M. Okay, thanks. We're going to work back across the table. Back to the big guy, Ivan. Yeah, so our, for our infrastructure, you know, Frankly, yeah, the EID has been fortunate uh, with our land base and the revenue stream that it provides us so that 
Uh, we have been able to do a very aggressive rehabilitation, um, particularly in the last, uh, say, 20 or, or 25 years. Uh, in my history there, uh, we've had a, uh, a budget of around 18 to $20 million for the past 25 years, and a big percentage, percentage of that has been from uh, revenues from the land base. So, you know, we, we do receive those monies, but that's poured all back into, into our infrastructure. And without it, uh, there's no doubt the EID would be a have-not district. Uh, we would have had to hire a bigger fellow than the six-foot-six guy, the Esmer ID, uh, hired uh, to do the uh, formula back in the day, as Harold mentioned yesterday. Um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, you know, so, okay, we have a little money in the bank. Uh, as I mentioned, we do own and operate our own headworks. Well, that comes with its own capital costs. Uh, we realize that at some point, that infrastructure will have to be replaced. The Bassano Dam core is 100 years old. Uh, you know, we have done some upgrades uh, on the upper end, uh, or uh, 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 basically from the water line up. It's, it's been redone in, in 85, but we realize there's a huge infrastructure cost there, and, uh, you know, we can't get into an infrastructure deficit. So um, while there's money in the bank, there's, you know, when you look at that, that piece of infrastructure alone, uh, just the concrete part of it is, is, you know, upwards of $100 million dollars and the earthen uh, dam is 45 to 50 million on top of that. So there alone um, is the con to owning and operating your own infrastructure uh, headworks. Um, the other thing with our district is the vast drainage network. Again, the, the benefits are to the, to the water user, but it comes at a cost. Um, we're mindful uh, in our district, we do that IRP th three-year rolling plan, um, but we also have our own five-year plan. So we're always analyzing our assets and our infrastructure. Uh, we do prioritize them. We run it through some criteria, a bit of a numbering system uh, to, uh, you know, come up with what are our worst areas, uh, you know, what do we want a pipeline, and then we take that list of projects and then prioritize it, uh, you know, in, in a different number of years uh, so that we are able to do that, uh, that amount of work within the, in the winter months. Um, you know, so I, I guess as a district, uh, you know, we, we can't be complacent. Um, I think we're always looking for ways uh, we can fund the district, innovative ways. Um, you know, we, you know, cut costs, um, you know, net zero, other districts are looking at, at options uh, that they can uh, subsidize their districts. I think the EID is, is, is no different. Um, you know, we have to think 100 years from now, we have a revenue stream now, 100 years from now, maybe that's not there. So we always have to be mindful of the next uh, generations coming and, and have that forward thinking. Thanks, Ivan. And uh, Chris, I'm going to ask you to wrap up this area for us. Okay, yeah, and just before lunch. Great. Okay. So I won't take too long. Um, so I guess in terms of infrastructure improvements, I can probably summarize it in terms of getting smarter about the way we manage our infrastructure. Um, it started actually with TID by, uh, by hiring our uh, district engineer. I'm going to point, put uh, Tony on the spot there, but... Having the, Gordon talked about it too, having the right people around you and making sure that the human resources and other resources that the district have are responsive to the expectations of the water users. And they expect us to be smarter about the way they, we use their money and <clears throat> making sure that we maintain the reliability and water security that they expect. Um, the fact that it's been taken for granted sometimes is actually a good thing. It means that we're doing our job. Um, but it, what we're doing at TID is, is that, yeah, there's been a drop in, in investment uh, from the provincial government. However, we have to keep going. We have to keep doing it and keep, go, keep doing it smarter. Um, we, we are going to be taking on, uh, um, and thanks, Jennifer, uh, the uh, uh, asset management. That's something that has been brought to our attention, starting with Jennifer and reinforced by a lot of others. We need to do condition evaluations, risk assessments, asset management, and full cost accounting. It's something we've already been doing, but we need to understand it better and quantify it 
better. Uh, in terms of uh, the way we manage our projects as well, we're doing a lot better job of project management. Ivan talked about five-year plans. We're working much further ahead now um, and using the resources that are available. The IRP program, our district-funded capital projects, uh, we're taking advantage of uh, the CAP funding and the Watershed Resiliency and Restoration Program in partnerships with our, our uh, neighboring municipalities. So yeah, that's basically it is. Be smarter about the way that we're managing our infrastructure and that's again driven by our water users and the expectation um, that we're going to do that. And it really comes down to what's our first purpose under the Irrigation Districts Act? To deliver water. So that comes to the heart of it right there. Thanks, Chris. Great summary. Uh, this is the time when you get to line up at the mic and uh, drill these guys with every difficult question that you may have. I think we can squeeze a couple of minutes out for that. Margo's given us a thumbs up for that. So if you do have an opportunity, we were hoping this panel would generate some discussion and some thought about some of these issues going forward. And we know we've had some of those raised throughout the morning. So uh, if we'll give people a couple of few seconds to muster up some questions and make their way to the mics and Apparently we're missing a mic. There's a mic has wandered off. I probably have that mic. Oh, thanks, Marco. <laughs> Anyways, I'll, I'll just talk loud. Um, the idea of amalgamating smaller districts with some larger districts has always been floated for quite some time. I want to ask these larger districts the benefit that maybe amalgamating with some of the smaller districts in terms of efficiencies, costs, and what benefit would it be to have a smaller, smaller district be, be involved with your district? It sounds like a question to start off with Ivan being the biggest district and maybe throw that back to Cam being the smallest district. You want to start that way? I already know what, whoa. <laughs> I already know what Cam thinks. I want to know what some of the other district things, but I would like to hear Cam too. Why don't you just point to somebody who you want to start with that question? Who do you want to start that the with? The fellow with a the, with the pen in his hand right there. Alan, okay. Well, I guess, I guess the biggest thing is proximity. Uh, is it possible to, uh, do they have the same water source, et cetera? Benefits that could be derived is uh, construction, maintenance, you have uh, equipment, maybe more equipment available on a, in a larger irrigation district to be able to get out and do the, vari the various maintenance or construction issues and that. Uh, certainly a larger, a larger uh, staff base. Uh, if you amalgamate a smaller district in, do you, do, you need as, uh, do you need to add all of those board members together or is there enough affiliation and maybe you got a smaller board in totality type of thing. So, but the biggest thing is location and where's the water source coming from and is it even feasible to combine these districts together? I understand that some of the smaller districts were taking a look at it. Uh, one of the concerns that I had heard was uh, contribution and one district having the equipment to do repairs but the other districts didn't have a lot of that and so it's a matter of uh, reconciliation to come to that point that it is agreeable to be more efficient in that area and it's going to be a joint a joint district. Anybody else got a comment on this? Uh, Chris? Yeah. Just a brief comment that even if you don't amalgamate there are certainly complementary um, activities that we do. For example, TID just invested recently uh, in a, a welding and fabrication facility, state-of-the-art but we have no tracked equipment uh, other than a tiny little, they call it the Kit Kat, our little uh, 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 cat uh, dozer. Um, there can be informal or memorandum, memorandum of understanding or mutual aid type agreements that you can work to try and um, add value to both districts without having to, uh, uh, to amalgamate. Anyone else? Cam, Ivan, Cam, you're making some notes. Yeah, no, I think with yeah, notes. Um, no, I think with with any uh, say amalgamation uh, or you know companies coming together. I mean, there has to be some synergies. There has to be some cost savings, etc. So there has to be mutual benefits. So you know, or benefits 
for both, right? Otherwise, uh, any amalgamation, yeah, I don't see that that working if there isn't some kind of mutual benefits uh, among amongst uh, um, the two two different organizations. Thankfully, the EID has it, it has its own boundaries between two rivers. So. <laughs> You don't want to associate with anybody else. <laughs> we'll, we'll let Cam give the final word here. Yes. Just give, give some thoughts, Cam. Say Raymond, McGrath, some of those ones that off the... I'm putting you on the spot, I know. We'll, well, talk, we'll a, talk later. Yeah. There's lots of pros and cons. You just obviously have to sit and see what... I think it's amongst the districts that need to discuss that, obviously. Yeah, does anybody on the panel know the answer to that or want to even speculate on that one? No, nope, apparently not. <laughs> yeah, we don't know the answer to that question. Another question at the mic? Hello, my name is Brian Bartell. I'm the general manager for the South Saskatchewan River Irrigation District. First of all, I'd like to thank Gord for your presentation, especially your video. I was able to see my uncle Pete Langman uh, on there, and, and I do have a copy of that. And my family's going to really enjoy seeing that. Thank you very much. Um, so my, my question is, it has to do with quality of water. In Saskatchewan, we have some very serious issues happening. Um, our Provincial Water Security Agency has determined that our canals are fish-bearing waters. And now that they're considered fish-bearing waters, we are now not allowed to apply Magnicide H in our canals. So uh, we feel that this is a, uh, a misinterpretation by our provincial... Uh, water Security Agency, and uh, it has really affected the supply of water for our irrigators. Uh, on our main supply canal, um, as of the start of July, they were not able to irrigate because of this situation. And I have been working with Lyle Stewart um, on this situation. We're trying to get this uh, uh, rectified before this season starts. Uh, we're hoping that this does not come to Alberta. I, I, uh, in talking with Margo and uh, other managers within the district here, it doesn't look like it will because it, it seems to be an interpretation by the Provincial uh, Water Security Agency. And I just wanted to get your take on this and what you, uh, what you feel on this. Who's going to jump on this one? Chris, you're smiling. Go for it. Yeah, I've had some conversations with Brian and emails back and forth. Um, we were pretty quick to support uh, SSRID on this because it's a significant issue. And, uh, you know, an irrigation district has to have the tools to be able to deliver the water to their water users. As simple as that. And the tool is there. Um, the Pest Management Regulatory Agency, Health Canada, I mean, their mantra is always, read the label. I mean, you guys know from spraying chemicals, they tell you, read the label, read the label. What does the label say? It says it's a federally approved uh, chemical for the treatment of, of uh, aquatic weeds and, and algae in irrigation canals. Well, that's an irrigation canal, and it's for the treatment of aquatic weeds and algae. That's pretty clear. So... Also under the label, it says it's up to the provincial government to set the rules. It's not saying the provincial gov government has the discretion to say yes or no. It's the provincial government says how. How is this label going to get applied in this province? That's my interpretation anyway. Right. Anybody else? Does that kind of give you some direction? Yeah, it does. It's, yeah. it's really good. I really, I really appreciate you know, the input from the districts here. And, uh, you know, it's, it's something that we have to really work hard on because it's really affecting growth for Saskatchewan right now. And w the other thing that happened here is this happened overnight. There was no con uh, consultation on this before they stopped us from uh, applying the Magnuside H. There was no opportunity for temporary uh, permits to continue through. So I will continue to update Alberta on this, and uh, thank you very much. Okay. Good question. Anybody else? Everybody's too hungry to ask a question. That's great. Uh, I think this panel's been uh, been good. Uh, I appreciate the panelists for their uh, time and effort and uh, thinking about the issues and participating, and let's give them a round of applause.
Thank you.